for a long time, the newspapers just considered these lads to be lobotomized Neanderthals who should all be, you know, taken outside and exterminated. So you've got some of these people that are supporting clubs in areas that have been put into managed decline by the government, right? Literally just like quietly cross-faded out of public view and just sort of like left. They want to be seen, they want to be heard, they want to be, make sure that no one could ignore them ever again. Toby Robinson is a self-styled football hooligan. Literally took his name from a member of Luton's firm. This impulse that once brought people to football violence now being manipulated into being more about nationalist violence or nationalist threat. So to write everyone off as a mindless thug, whether they're involved in football violence or unfortunately, whether or not they're involved in things like Southport, it really lets society off the hook in a way that I felt was unacceptable. Sam Dis, welcome to Politics Joe. How are you? Hello, mate. Yeah, I'm good. How are you doing? Yes, very well, thank you. Um, very excited to talk to you about the English disease, your podcast series. But before we come to that, tell us who you are. What do you do? Um, so I guess I'm a football writer and have been for about a decade now. Um, and I kind of have a, an at best ambivalent relationship with football. And I would say, despite being a West Ham fan, maybe because of being a West Ham fan, I'm much more interested in what happens off the pitch than on the pitch and kind of always have been. I think for a long time, there wasn't really a market for that kind of writing, unless you were your Nick Hornby's or whoever else it might be. Um, and so we started a magazine called Mundial, which really focused on a lot of that stuff. And it was a lot more about the nostalgia of football, but also kind of like really tapping into like why um, these sort of like certain games, stadiums, cultures, countries, identities really sort of like embedded themselves in different football fans psyche and then when I left there I was kind of a bit like what do I do next and this you know well, I'm sure we'll talk about it but like the idea that turned into the English disease has kind of been like percolating in my head for a long time. What does football hooligan mean when when we use that phrase what does it mean? It means mindless thug right as, but that's basically what it is. And, you know, if you go all the way back to sort of like the yeah, etymology, it's a bit murky. But it mostly comes from newspaper reports and certain typos or the way these things get lost in the sands of time around an Irish surname, probably Houlihan, um, and the sort of like the unruly nature of the other, basically, and a way of really separating between these two things. You look at the way that it changes, it was uh, a term that was used for striking minors. It was a term that was used for unruly kids. It's been a term that's been used for, you know, I think what's really interesting about the way that it's changed is how it becomes weaponized. And then as it becomes weaponized, how it actually becomes, rather than some a stick to dig someone with, it actually becomes a bit of a badge of honor. Mm. You know, a lot of the people that we spoke to, they were like, you know, some people were like, the word hooligan isn't useful. Those are mostly academics. You actually speak to people who are involved in football violence, and they're like, yeah, I'm a fucking hooligan. Or I was a fucking hooligan. Would love seeing their picture in the paper with that headline above it. 100%. You know, people told me stories about them being in Nick and their mate bringing a pa like paper in and showing them in the paper. And then be like, yeah. <laughs> that's mad. And they, they know that that's mad, but like yeah. it's, it's what that is tapping into you know, we talk about the definition of the word, it's like self-definition. I am now a thing during a time when they probably didn't feel like they had any sort of identity or they've grown up in a society which is, which seems to be actively trying to remove any sort of agency, remove any sort of like power that they may have to self-define besides class, you know, and the way that the word hooligan has changed now, it's never been something that's been, there's been a legal definition. People have tried for a long time, or certainly during its heyday. And it would occasionally get used by police or occasionally get used in courtrooms, but it'd always be a little bit more informally. The word has dropped out of use a little bit. I've started to see it come back, you know, especially mm -hmm. since COVID where there was an uptick in football violence and, and football related disorder um, coming out of that, which was kind of, wishy-washy you know our oh, people have been bored at home and you know what else are they going to do apart from like just go out when they finally can and just cause chaos i guess mm. um but it's just so much deeper than that you know there is like very clearly 
something at the heart of it, which one word has come to represent. What that actually speaks to, for me, and the reason why I wanted to do the project was some of the real core issues at the heart of British or English society, specifically class. Mm. Always comes down to class, doesn't it? It's just like it's just like the big buzzword, which is like, "dong." It's about class. You won't believe the conclusion yeah, we come yeah. to in the podcast. It's, it's about you, class. If you've not listened to it yet, this is not a spoiler. <laughs> it is about class. Yeah, turns out. Um, there's also a there's a really interesting line. I think it's in the first episode, and I know it was interesting because when me and Laura were preparing questions for this, both for both of us, the first thing we wrote down was this line, and it's about. I'll quote it. You sort of you say football hooliganism felt ubiquitous, and you also say emerged the two things that England loves most: football and fear. Mm. Tell me about the last part there. What do you mean when you say the two things that England loves most: football and fear? Well, one, it's a fucking good line, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's really good. <laughs> I will say that. Sure, I will say that. It's just sometimes you write them and you're just like, yeah, I'll, I'll keep that one. <laughs> um, but I think mostly it's it's just a country that sort of like gleans energy and life force from stimulating fear and being scared of things and creating that fear and continuing to, you know, build upon it and keep it going and keep it going and keep it going. You look at the way that it's constantly demonized every single subset of society, which it deems to be different or ununderstandable or whatever it might be. And I think that you know, its relationship to football is pretty well documented. We quote unquote invented it. Certainly we packaged it best. Uh, and so that becomes a really core part of the English identity. The fact that there's this other element of it, which is also become, which also became so ubiquitous to English football. You know, they, it was called the English disease by clubs, uh, by, sorry, by countries across Europe but it was also referred to by our own press in this kind of way that was meant to be shaming, but I think shone, shone a light very, very clearly on far more than they really thought that it did. And I think that, you know, it was a, an opportunity for us to kind of like explore this idea of moral panic and the way that the newspapers especially, but I would say government as well, police definitely, the clubs eventually, you know, the people that sort of like bring the money into the league as well, all of them saw an opportunity to really fuel these fears and how the only solution was to, I think Bill Buford in the first episode, who's a legend, love Bill. He was like, you know, for a long time, the newspapers just considered these lads to be uh, lobotomized Neanderthals who should all be you know, taken outside and exterminated. Because it was a real sort of like, these are people that are beyond comprehension. And instead of trying to sit down and work out why, it'd be better to just fucking bullet all of them in the back of the head mm. and just get rid of them. And just like draw a big curtain around all of them and just move on. And I think that for a long time, football really felt that it did that quite well by throwing money at it, you know, I'm, a relative cynic when it comes to these sort of things. But if you look at like the confluence of the Taylor report, which came in after Hillsborough, um, the kind of peak of football violence um, around the sort of like the uh, mid to late eighties and into the early nineties and the advent of the Premier League, all of a sudden you've got all these cameras around, a lot more money involved, a lot more sponsors involved. What they don't want is lads fucking around in the terraces or there'd be stands then anyone messing with the golden goose the best way to do that and the best way to control people is through fear and you start to turn everyday people against everyday people you know it's one of the interesting things i've i've, I've found is this idea that like the class structures of like how people speak are, are, are really, really important. You know, you've got like the media classes talking about mostly working class fans, because not everyone involved in football violence was working class, but lower middle class sometimes. But then also the way that they would also create these things that were then read by other working class people. And they, they again, it comes down to how they start to create definitions of themselves or like 
ideas of what these people are like. And then you start to create divisions within a class structure, which again is just like, it's just built and built and built and built into not just being about football violence now, as we go on to in the show, it's become that same tactic just used ad nauseum for so much more. Mm. It's really interesting hearing you talk talk about that fear in the context of class because so much of the perception looking down on the football fans is and people who are committing sort of violence at football matches or around football matches is fear condescension othering and then I've forgotten uh, the academic's name that you interview who used to be married to a football fan who Lisa, doc, sorry doctor, doctor Lisa McKenzie yeah. yeah Dr. Lisa McKenzie and one of her lines that I found really striking is she was like, yeah, he was fit. Like he was sexy. It's like the, she was like, why wouldn't you want to go out with a Jack the Lad? Someone who had a bit about them, had a swagger, was confident, was charismatic and could handle themselves. And I found that very interesting because I guess you're, you're, almost, you're almost conditioned to the point to conceive of anyone who has a scrap at a football match, as you said, mindless thug, hooligan, but that's from your own perspective, my own perspective, right? It's not the one, Lisa's perspective was certainly very, very different. And I think that can only be, I mean, she's open about it, right? But characterized by her class position, the way that she looked upon lads like that. Yeah, definitely. I also think the people that get to make these definitions and make these decisions are very often not the people that are involved in any of this sort of stuff or know anyone, frankly, that was involved in any of this sort of stuff. You know, I was a little bit shocked to hear Lisa say that in such like plain terms. So I was like, I think I said this in voiceover. I was like, you don't really hear people speaking like that anymore. You know, we had very few relative to the length and the subject matter of what the show was discussions about toxic masculinity, because you've got this idea of what masculinity is or should be that's constantly being redefined. And then you've got these people that feel outside of that conversation. And so you've got someone like Lisa, who is very clearly a very strong, learned woman who grew up, you know, she's a miner's daughter. She's from a small town outside of a heavily industrialized, deindustrialized city in uh, the Midlands, who didn't see anything wrong with what they were doing. You know, she's a very smart, very sharp, switched on woman. And yes, she's a professional agitator and loves, loves telling people things that will put the shits up them. But ultimately, you can see the appeal, right? You can see the appeal from for, for women, or you can see the appeal for men. You can see the why people really feel like it is important to be able to create these identities for themselves and be able to sort of like have agency and have power mm. in, in whatever way we may deem that to be fucked up or we may deem that to be unacceptable. You know, to them at that point in time, that was their way of making sense of the world. And I think that the people who get to decide if that's right and wrong are very, very, I mean, not even very rarely, never happens that they're also the people that are even involved in anything like that sort of lifestyle. Yeah. The, the really interesting part of that in her own analysis of it, she talks about the omnipresence of violence, right? Mm -hmm. As a working class person. She said, and that's manifest literally and physically in, for example, like getting clipped by your mum with a pair of slippers or, you know, nicking something from a corner shop and getting chased down the road by the bloke who owns it. And you could expand it out to, I guess you could offer sort of quite abstract definitions about the dynamics of class power and whether that constitutes violence. But then if that is your existence and violence is everywhere in your day-to-day -day life, you don't then have the moralizing judgment of being like, well, you know, when Dave goes to the, goes to the football, he gets in a scrap every weekend. It's like, well, he's actually just taking agency over the violence that surrounds him day to day anyway. So what's, you know, what's the big deal, I guess, is a, is a way of thinking about it. Totally. I mean, look, you could be in a pub and someone could, like the police could just come into the pub. And I've heard stories of this happen. I've heard my dad tell me stories of this happening. And my dad was not involved in anything like football violence, where they would just turn up to the pub, open up one of the windows or smash one of the windows and chuck a gas canister in and just go in and just clear everyone out. That's growing up with violence. You know what I mean? Mm. It's not just the violence that you have actual agency over. You know, you touched on these more abstract definitions of it. You know, the way that the class system is skewed against people constantly having to live under oppression is a form of violence constantly. These people that are, that are just sort of like being like, 
I want to have safety in a way that makes me feel like I have agency, but also I'm having fun. That's also the thing that like people find it really, really hard to get their nut around. It's just like, it's a lot of fun for a lot of people. And again, it's just like what my definition of fun might be or your definition of fun or, you know, lawmakers definition of fun. You can, you can disagree with the way that they do it, but like you have to reckon with why people are feeling this impulse to go out and find the buzz of having a fight. Because mm. also, you know, without putting too fine a point on it, these are all consenting adults. You know what I mean? Very rare. I mean, there are obviously exceptions, but very rarely are people getting picked on that weren't also there for the same thing. Yeah. By and large, it was war games. You know, my team versus your team. But it's like, we're not doing it on the pitch. We're just doing it, planning to meet you at this pub or this alley or this park or this wherever. Yeah. And I think it's just like, by not really reckoning with like what, where that impulse comes from, how do you ever really expect to give people agency in more healthy ways mm. you know you can't just like i mean we talked about it later on in the, in the episode you know you can you can very easily just like throw these people in jail or ban them from football but like lisa says you know if there's a vacuum it will get filled and you have to kind of work out what creates that vacuum and that for a long time has been a question that fucking nobody wanted to ask mm. this i almost have to like stop myself in the middle of this conversation because we're sort of essentially saying like these guys are deriving meaning and belonging and a sense of enjoyment from kicking the piss out of each other at the weekend. And you, it's all, it almost feels like over intellectualizing or, you know, pr you know, pr projecting something onto it that isn't perhaps always necessarily there. And then I'm checking myself thinking, is that impulse a product of the characterization of this as mindless violence over decades and decades and decades. I don't know. Was that a fear for you when you were approaching this in the way that you did? Because, I mean, as we've already discussed, right, the writing in it is beautiful. It's insightful. It's dramatic. How did you feel about maybe, I don't know, overdressing or, or philosophizing, intellectualizing something that might necessarily not actually have much of a, an underpinning to it beyond an impulse to fight someone? I think it's an interesting question. You know, in the build up to making the show, I tried, really did try to read a lot of the academic literature around it. It is very clearly written in a language which is in, intentionally or otherwise exclusive of people like me who aren't, you know, well versed in academic ease. And so like just trying to really understand it, I was like, I really did try to drop a lot of the preconceived notions that I had. You know, when I first started telling people about the show, when it was just really in its early gestation periods, the two things that they would always say to me was, one that you brought up earlier, isn't that all done with now? Why would we make a show about it now? And the other one was, are you just glorifying violence? It's just not up to me yeah. to decide whether a violence should or should not be glorified. I think that there are certain kinds of violence which I am wholly against. Is this one of them? I think it's a more complicated question than than a lot of these questions that we that we ask ourselves. And that's also a good thing to try and sit with and try and work that out. You know, my own political biases definitely sort of like play a part in my viewpoint and how I approach the show. But at no point did I ever want to go, oh, by the way, violence is bad. Mm. You know what I mean? Because it's like violence means so many different things. Violence is a way of rebellion or protest or any of these sort of things. You interview people that participate in football violence, mm. did past and present. Mm -hmm. What did they tell you it meant to them? I don't want to oversimplify it, but you know, it all just comes down to belonging, a word we've already used. And really understanding that people's stories are a lot more similar than they are different. And whether that's you're involved in football violence or not, I think there's an impulse to be understood. There's an impulse to be seen and heard there's an impulse to find people who are like you and to find safety however that may be you know people want you know work their ass off and get into universities and then try to find a community that will end up giving them a pathway towards a job that makes them feel safety there's not a million miles away from that from being like a 13 14 year old boy and finding that safety through an older lad who puts an arm around you and being like come on we're going you know bristol city away and then being like 
I now have a people that help me define myself or now make me feel like I'm not alone. You know, it was kind of, I felt like the most stark representation of that was by interviewing non-white hooligans, which are which make up, by and large, most of the people that we spoke to. Because I felt like it was like a really clear way of approaching not just the the politics of the subculture, which skews, not always, but, but has sort of like traditionally skewed a little bit more right than not. And in some cases, a lot more right. There are a lot of like left-wing firms. I should caveat that. People will get annoyed otherwise. Um, but I think that there's been a couplet of like racist and hooligan for a long time. And so by interviewing, you know, Jack, who's mixed race, um, Charlie, who's black, and Riaz later on, who is Asian, I felt like that was a really interesting way of really challenging what this idea of definition meant. You know, really working out what your place is in English society through joining these like reviled brotherhoods that are existing in the gutters of, you know, its populace. I thought that that was a fascinating way of thinking about what it means to be English. Mm. To, to, without putting too fine a point on it, but just to be explicit for the audience, you know, for, for one of your interviewees who is black and was in, involved in football violence in the 80s, it's already a dangerous thing to be doing, right? But when the National Front is very explicitly present or on the terraces around football stadiums, it was sort of their key recruitment, recruitment areas, right? It was the way they built that political movement. If you're a black lad in a football firm, it's more than dangerous, right? Like you, you're, you, you are the key target almost, right? If there's if there's a situation of violence because of that, because of the racism that's associated or close to those firms. Yeah, you know, you get a lot of, you know, the, there are areas of the politics of it and the and the stories around identity that I w were outside my purview, quite frankly. You know, I am not a black man, funny enough, and that's uh, a whole story that I think needs to be explored so much more. But for the purposes of this show, you know, hearing Charlie speak about this idea of hearing racism on the terraces from people who are his mates and then kind of them turning around and being like, but you're all right, mate. It's not you. Or being in fights and someone be like, you black cunt or whatever. And him just being like, I'm having to deal with that, but I know that I'm not on my own here. Even if the people around me also hold quite a lot of prejudices, outright racisms you've just kind of just got to do what you do to get by and i think that obviously that's an incredibly stark example of needs must but that's what that is right mm. it's just you just do what you got to do to survive and it can sound melodramatic to put it in those terms but like if you're growing up a second gener generation you know caribbean immigrant in essentially slums of a already you know deprived area you're just gonna have to just find a way to make it through however you can and to judge that by normal terms is impossible because i don't even think charlie has fully reckoned with what that means and you can see you know he's someone who's got like a relatively normal life he's got a square job you know we, we that's one of the reasons why we had to use a pseudonym for him because he was like you know, people still don't get it. You listen to him talk about it and he's he's like, these are the best days of my life. Mm. But that he, he's saying these are the best days of my life where not a lot of people of colour growing up in England were experiencing the best days of their life. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's quite a unique position for him to find himself in, especially where he was in the social strata. Yeah. There's two things in that, that I want to talk about more. One is extreme right politics and its connection to football violence perceived or otherwise but i just let's just drill down into the way the way i've kind of been talking about it the way a lot of people talk about it is it as a phenomenon of the past mm -hmm. that football violence doesn't happen anymore and that's not the case is it it's changed but it's here could you could you talk a little bit about that well i think the one of the big ways that football violence has changed is that it very rarely happens at the actual football now you know especially at the top levels, Premier League especially, Championship as well. Everything's so heavily policed. Um, there are so many cameras around. Banning orders are impossible to get away from. You know, you're around a football stadium, you're essentially entering a surveillance state. Mm. 
you know and also there are all this there's all this legislature where if you hit someone on a friday and there's not a game on you might get x sentence if you hit someone on a saturday and there's a, you're going to the match you're going to get three years you're going to get four years you know so you've got this like really harsh sentencing all that sort of stuff which it doesn't go away that impulse doesn't disappear they just change. What what they change is they become more overtly political, as in some of the groups that we explore in the show. Or they're just like, you know, they're being more creative with where they're going. They're not meeting up at the ground. They're meeting up at a park a mile or two down the road, or they're meeting up in an alleyway a mile or two down the road, or a car park, or wherever it may be, where you're walking past it. I think Jack says it right at the start, you know. You walk past a car park and it's filled with like 10 geezers having a scrap. You might not necessarily think that that's about football. But it is, you know, and they're dealing with it on WhatsApp. You know, you'll have these like intermediaries planning and be like, right, we'll meet you at this time. That doesn't quite work for us. All right, our train gets in or whatever. <laughs> having a date. <laughs> you know, it's just like trying to meet your mates for anything. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, what day can you do? It's oh, like, oh, I can't mate. do that. And you end up having a fight in November sometime <laughs> and you're planning this at the start of the season. Um, but it's, you know, I think this also just kind of comes down to this idea of like, this is not mindless violence. Like Lisa says it in the show. It's got theory. It's got planning. It's got so much identity behind it, so much stuff that has thought. This isn't mindless. Mm. There is a reason why they're doing it. Whether or not some of these people can articulate it, and that's nothing against them, it's just a, their experience of it. But whether they can articulate it or not is besides the point. There is very clearly something going on there that is so much deeper than what we've been led to believe. But in terms of how it, how it is now, you know, instances of football related violence had peaked or kind of, sorry, had, had gone up after lockdown. I've kind of tapered off a little bit. West Ham remain at the top of the Premier League table in terms of arrests at football. <laughs> Go on, lads. Uh, well done. All, all you've got yeah. to cling on to. <laughs> Win's a win. Um, but it's, you know, you, you've got a whole pyramid of football that is outside of these upper echelons. Yep. You know, I support not a very good Premier League team, but they're still a Premier League team. You know, you go to Stockport, you go to, you know, any, I mean, I'm not even going to list them, but Tranmere's or any of that in like these big, around these big cities that have got big clubs with big fan bases that have long histories and important stadiums and important communities. You know, there's pockets of football violence every single weekend. You might not just like hear about it because it isn't listed in arrest figures or you might just see it pop up on, a Facebook group called like UK footy fights or something like that. Yeah. Casual things, ultras. Yeah. yeah. These things are still happening. You know what I mean? But they're changing and you, you, it's funny. There's a whole subsection of TikTok that is just hooliganism. And it's just like middle-aged lads calling out Millwall Terry or whatever, or why don't you come down our manor and I'll do you in and all this sort of stuff. But then also you've just got all these kids where, you know, they've all got hoods on and scarves on and like that. And they're all just beating the shit out of each other. And I think that, you know, that's cl very clearly changed from this idea, maybe the romanticized notion that some people have of the football casual and like best clobber and you're a top boy and all that sort of stuff. But these, subcult these subcultures change. And I think that it's really going through a period of flux, but it's not gone away mm. by any stretch of the imagination. The, the last point I'd like to talk about then is over the summer we had these, this wave of riots and uh, Tommy Robinson protest weekend just gone one before and very often the phrase in the media to describe people at these riots is football hooligan mm -hmm. sometimes at the Tommy stuff you know there might be sort of democratic football lads alliance or whatever it is they call themselves now but I've reported from these places sometimes there are people there with club badges tattooed on them sometimes there are people there in football kits a lot of them aren't a lot of them there's actually not much to to know any kind of football club affiliation but they still get called football hooligans. Mm. I just invite your sort of general view of that to begin with, whether or not you think it's an accurate descriptor, whether we're almost in a, pa whether it's a pattern of description that because of that time in the eighties, when there was more of a connection between the far right and um, football violence, whether it's just like uh, reverting to past time, how much, what, what sort of connection do you see there now, basically in the modern world compared to the eighties? Well, I went around in the 80s, yeah. but so I can only speak to it from uh, you know, anecdotally and, and in my research and, and the stuff that I've heard. But I think now, 
I think there is a football element to it. Whether or not that is overt, as in like, is actually, I, know, I saw the mobilisation of firms. I saw the mobilisation of football fans. Mm. You know, Toby Robinson is a self-styled football hooligan, ex-football hooligan. Literally took his name from a member of Luton's firm, you know. You can't really then quibble when some people use football as a descriptor for, you know, some of the subsections, subsections rather, of of the people who are, who are going to these quote-unquote protests. I do think that it is one of those things where it is oversimplifying things again. You know, I think it is a subsection of a subsection of society that are actual hooligans that are coming out to this sort of stuff. But I think that what we, you know, how it came out in the, in the show was seeing this impulse that once brought people to football violence now being manipulated into being more about nationalist violence or nationalist threat or action or whatever that may be. That's not to say, you know, I, I really want to make that clear. You know, I'm not saying that all hooligans are right wing. I'm not saying that all football fans are right wing. I'm not saying that everyone who is involved with ultra far right politics is, you know, involved in football. Yeah, you know, these are all massive oversimplifications. Yep. But undoubtedly there is a link there to a certain subsection, but a sizable enough section that the self-styled leader of it has very clearly created an identity from himself that comes from this world. Mm. And you look at the iconography, a lot of Stone Island, a lot of football kits, a lot of, you know, you see a lot of clubs' names on St. George flags and, and all that sort of caper. And it's like, it's all very football. The chanting, all very football. You know, in, inevitably there's going to be some of that because of the way that football has embedded itself in the psyche of England. But it's undoubtedly a presence. Is in my experience. Yeah. Can you tell me more about that um, sort of what you saw in those WhatsApp groups, that kind of, I don't know if the word I would use would be radicalization, but that process. Process, I think, is a better word for it because it's like, it's a, it's quite a slow and subtle process, mm. weirdly. It's like a slowly, slowly and all at once and it really does start to snowball. So we found this, we went to a few marches and to cut the protests and we saw that people were arranging you know, the logistics of it on WhatsApp and on Facebook. And so we just did some digging, working out where they were being. We saw the same sort of names popping up. So we were like, all right, did a, a rough spot of Googling. You realize how easy it is to get into some of these groups. So we got into one which happened to be the biggest football casual banter group on Facebook and WhatsApp. Yeah, I think it might actually be its official tagline. <laughs> um, it's catchy. Um, and going in there at first, was just expecting just sort of like the stuff where, I mean, I don't know about the middle-aged men in your life, whether or not they just like forward you a joke where you just roll your eyes and go, oh, nice one. And you just, yeah. just keep, keep on scrolling. It's funny because like the dad sending the thumbs up emoji is the stereotype. But quite often when I receive the middle-aged content, that is my response to it as well. It's very like, yeah. Nice one, mate. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of nice one mates going on. But it's also <laughs> like, I expected a lot of that. And the artifice of banter just quite quickly just fell away. And you really saw how it really quickly became a support group for a lot of people. You hear a lot of like quite distressing stories, the veracity of which are obviously up for debate sometimes, but feeling isolated and alienated and sad and angry, scared, frustrated, all of these words. And finding kindred spirits in this group. You know what I mean? Mm. In the WhatsApp group especially is like a smaller little subsection. The Facebook group is a lot larger. That You've probably got you know a few hundred people in this WhatsApp. Where they might be the first people they speak to when they wake up in the morning. They might be the, lad, the people that they say night lads to before they go to bed. You don't know how much interaction they're having with that many people outside of that. And I spoke to the founder of this specific group who we'll call Billy. He was like... The, I've tried shutting it down because I've I've seen how poisonous some of the conversation can can get, especially when it comes any you know any lightning rod moment in in politics or in society. It plays out in a big way there. You know when Keir Starmer was voted in, the vitriol levels went up and up and up. 
any time there is anything involving any refugee or someone of Asian or Muslim descent in the in the news, it would just be like, you know, squirting light of fluid on, on a bonfire. He saw that and he, you know, he created this group to sort of like keep the lads together and he was like ex-Millwall and ex-Rangers and all this sort of stuff. And he was like, I tried to close the group down and people were texting me being like, I'm homeless, I've been kicked out of my house, this is the only thing I've got. You know, him talking about some of these lads messaging him separately, talking about like their suicidal ideation, feeling that are so palpably sad that it does make you feel differently about people who are sharing these extremely, you know, in my personal view, disgusting views on their phones constantly. And these are normal blokes. Mm. These aren't, you know, skinhead thugs with a swastika on the back of their neck. These are people who have normal jobs, quote unquote normal jobs, everyday jobs, people that would work around here or that have been in your house working on stuff or that you've met in the shops or in the pub or you probably know. And I think that was what was so important about really understanding it because it was like, these are all people that have kind of like gathered because they part they were part of a football casual fraternity, however loose knit that may have been. And now their main grievance wasn't so and so firm said that they did a sin that wherever we need to get them back. It was two tier care is fucking me over specifically. We need to hit them where it hurts and make sure no one can ever forget about us. And there was just this constant refrain of they can't forget about us or they want to forget about us. So you've got some of these people that are supporting clubs in areas that have been put into managed decline by the government, right? Literally just like quietly cross-faded out of public view and just sort of like left. They want to be seen, they want to be heard, they want to be make sure that no one could ignore them ever again. And they had this outlet in football, however twisted and fucked some people might see that as being. But without even having that outlet, what comes next? You know, and I think that we saw a little bit of that in the summer. And I think that it really does hit upon this bigger question. What are our priorities? Are our priorities really in order? Mm. You know, is it more important that people don't cause, you know, a ruckus at football? Or is it more important that people don't feel like they have no outlet whatsoever and they're burning down hostels filled with migrants. You know, it's not an either or, it's not a simple question, but the impulse comes from a very centralized place. Mm. It comes from somewhere that is so much more common than I think any of us really reckon with. And the fact that violence lives in all of us, as much as we all like to pretend that it doesn't, we all have the propensity for violence. It's how we actually deal with the external factors and sometimes the internal factors of like, what is at play at any one moment? And the judgment then that we levy against other people who may not have the tools or the experience to deal with those factors. And sometimes it could be, you know, fucking hell, there's as many factors as there are different people in the world. So to write everyone off as a mindless thug, whether they're involved in football violence or unfortunately, whether or not they're involved in things like Southport, it really lets society off the hook in a way that I felt was unacceptable. And in whatever small little way that I could shine a light on that in six episodes of a football related podcast, I think that's what we tried to do. I think it is what you did do. It's a brilliant podcast. Um, it's been a brilliant interview. I'm really, really grateful that you came in to talk to us. Sam, thank you so much. Thanks, mate. I enjoyed it. Me too.